Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So the altar book, which gives me the instructions for the various liturgies and services we use in the church, gives general notes for special services such as today. So for the planning of Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday <coughs> service, it says, The service of Passion Sunday, beginning with the procession of palms, reflects the contrasting attitudes towards Jesus that were on display during the days leading up to his crucifixion. Palm Sunday is named after the palms that were spread before Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. The acclamation of the people, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, clearly reveals that they hailed Jesus as the messianic king. Yet only days later, our Lord would hear the cry, crucify. This contrast is reflected on this day as the joy of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem gives way to the somber remembrance of his passion. The extended reading from the Passion narrative sets before the faithful all that our Lord did on our behalf. Thus the church is prepared to enter Holy Week, the most important week of the entire church year. Indeed, today is a day to observe a contrast, to recognize the two extremes and how they still weave together into one paradoxical whole. Today we remember the joy of the crowd shouting, Hosanna, which means save us, a recognition and confession that Jesus is the Messiah, come to deliver his people. We remember the jealousy of the leaders who plot to kill him before he gathers any more followers. We remember the palm branches that were strewn before him, a sign of victory and celebration as we wave our own palm branches and we wear our palm crosses today. And we think on the cries demanding his crucifixion, trying to assure ourselves we never would have joined in with such evil, while secretly suspecting we very may well have gone along with the crowds had we been there. We are excitedly making our plans for Easter dinner, getting ready for that beautiful celebration next Sunday. But we remember we still have to get through Good Friday before then. We long to step into that glorious celebration after the long penitential season of Lent, but we know that first we have to endure the shame and sorrow of the triune. And so it is fitting that our epistle text for today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, where he likewise examines the two extremes of Christ's incarnation. He begins with the celebratory confession of Christ's divinity. He says he is in the form of God, or you could translate that into the image of God, because he is God. As John confesses in his prologue, the word was with God and the word was God. So Paul is evoking some nice Trinitarian language for us here, recognizing that while Jesus is not the Father, he is worthy of that same amount of glory, laud, and honor, for they are both God. Yet on first appearances, his incarnation seems to be the exact opposite of that sentiment. But Paul goes on to explain that even though he fully deserves to be worshipped and praised and adored as much as the Father, he did not consider that glory something to be grasped or clung onto. Jesus did not declare he was going to spend all of eternity sitting on his heavenly throne while the cherubim and seraphim sing, Kadosh, 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 Yahweh, Sabaot, Holy, 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 Lord God of the heavenly host even though it is entirely within his rights to do that. Instead, Jesus took on the form of a servant, the form of a man. And that word for form, it's the same in the Greek text for both sentences. He is the form of God, he is the form of man. As much as he is fully God, he is now fully man. He has emptied himself, he has put aside the glory that is rightfully his, and instead has deigned to walk among us as one of us. He's not play-acting, he's not pretending to be human, he's not God in a human suit, he is fully human. As I said in my Christmas sermon a couple of months ago, the whole incarnation, therefore, has been an act of humiliation for the word by which all creation was spoken into existence who now walks among us as one of his own creations. At the same time, though, the reality of his divinity remains. Though he emptied himself in the incarnation, he remains God. Those two complete natures dwell within the one person in the mystery of the hypostatic union, which is, you know, again, one of those great church mysteries right up there with the Trinity. We can't fully explain it. We don't really grasp it because the math doesn't work out. Ozzy 100% God, 100% man, yet 
100% Jesus, not 200%. It doesn't add up, and we have to take it on faith that it is as he says it is. So this is especially important to remember today and through this coming Holy Week. Though he's in the form of man, he maintains his omniscience and his omnipotence. Though he has, in a sense, set aside his power as God, he still has access to it, as we've seen by the various miracles he's done in his ministry. So as he is riding towards Jerusalem, a humble man on a donkey to the shouts of crowds, thinking he has come to deliver an earthly kingdom to them, a restored throne of David with no more Roman influence, he already knows the evil thoughts that the Jewish leaders are harboring against him. He knows the future that is in store for him. And even though he knows no, no one in that crowd fully grasps who he is, he knows that he could show them if he wanted to. He could demand the worship of everyone in that city, even though the higher-ups were applauding his demise, and he could make that happen. He could transform that donkey into a mighty war horse. He could reveal his full majesty and remove any doubt that he is truly God walking among us. He could give the people what they want. He could kick the Romans out, establish an earthly kingdom, and rule the physical world from Israel as an unquestioned superpower, pouring out the wrath of God on any who would threaten the nation. You know, these are things that we might expect God to do, and certainly what all the mythologies of the world would expect of their gods. But that's not what our God does. Not only does he humble himself to take on the form of a servant of a lowly human, setting aside his majesty and heavenly glory for the sake of dwelling among us, he goes even further. Paul explains that he remained obedient to the will of the Father, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's a line we've heard countless times. We, you know, we recall his death on the cross every Sunday. We have images of crucifixes in our sanctuary and in all other aspects of our Christian lives to the point where I think that line has lost some of its meaning. You know, we, again, we're familiar with the image of the cross. For us, it just automatically translates to Jesus. So when we read Paul saying he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, we think, well, yeah, that's how Jesus died. Everyone knows that. I mean, yeah, we get, we get some reminders sometimes about how agonizing of a death it is. We have movies like The Passion of the Christ to remind us of the physical suffering that came with it, but we don't really grasp the social aspect of crucifixion. See, in the Roman world, it's not just a form of execution. It's also a means of public humiliation on top of that. I can't really think of a modern counterpart. The best I can think of is, you know, we have the electric chair, which we only use for criminals, so if you hear someone die by the electric chair, you already get kind of a picture of what sort of person it is, but it still doesn't convey the full weight of crucifixion. So crucifixion was reserved for especially egregious crimes. Victims would be hung naked, not the nice loincloth we have on our censored images, but they would be naked on the cross, publicly, completely exposed, to the people. The crosses would not be raised up high like we always have the paintings. They would be low to the ground so that scavenger animals could come and gnaw on their feet. The whole point of crucifixion was to make a public spectacle, spectacle to everyone of how terrible that person's crime was, how they deserve the absolute worst punishment we can think of for them, essentially displaying that because of what they have done, they are subhuman and beneath pity. Those on the cross were a warning against the terrible deeds that earned their sentence, yes, but the, that sentence was a statement from the government and for society how they should be valued, which is that they are utterly worthless. There's a reason that the scriptures say, cursed is any man who hangs on the tree. It is a death utterly bereft of any kind of dignity, any kind of romanticization. You know, humanity could maybe grasp the concept of a God dying if it's a noble death. Yeah, the concept of a God dying is still shocking, but we could buy something clean and honorable. You know, if Jesus nobly drank the hemlock like Socrates does, if he courageously committed seppuku like a, a samurai, we could go with that, I think. But a cross? That terrible thing reserved only for the criminal dregs of society that we would have been better off if they had never been born. If God is going to die, it will certainly not be on that. That's what he does. He becomes a curse for our sake, that we may be spared the curse of our sin. 
And he knows this is what he is riding towards on Palm Sunday. He knows the end result of these cheers that they're, they're giving him, which already pale in comparison to the heavenly worship of the cherubim and seraphim. They are going to give way to cries for his crucifixion. And he rides towards it willingly. And as he does so, he reveals the Father to us as he has always done, as he has done ever since there was a creation for the Father to be revealed to. Because it's on the cross where the Father's love is revealed to us, where we meet God in the place that he suffers for us, where he takes our sins upon himself to die so that we might live. As humiliating and stigmatizing as it may be, it becomes the most noble death. So the theme of our paradoxical contrast is fulfilled so that in the end, the cross becomes his throne. That crown of thorns that was placed on him in mockery becomes a crown of supreme rulership over all creation. For in the ultimate humiliation of the cross, he is exalted over all things. As he becomes a curse to die, he takes the curse of death with him. <coughs> Therefore, Paul tells us, he has been given the name above all names. That glory that remained hidden during his whole earthly ministry, which he restrained during that entrance into Jerusalem, will be known throughout every realm on the last day. The day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the lordship of our Lord over heaven and earth and all things under the earth. Nothing will deny his majesty. All will see and know that he is king of kings and lord of lords. So embrace the dualities of this Palm Sunday. Let us truly celebrate his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and all of that that entails. Let us truly mourn the faith that he marches towards for our sake. Let us confront our own sins, which kill our God, with fear and trembling. Let us look forward to his glorious resurrection and his promise to us with joy and exultation. Let us remember that, even though now it's kind of become a generic word of praise, that word Hosanna is a plea, a prayer for salvation. And remembering that, let us all declare, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and turn that life everlasting. Amen. Amen.